Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. This is Real Life Talks and I'm your host Yvonne Heath, author of Love Your Life to Death and founder of the I Just Showed Up movement. So today I'm so excited that Nancy Osborne, hello Nancy, hello Yvonne, has joined us here in the studio um, and we're going to find out all about I Got This and what that means but first we're going to watch a little clip of Nancy in action. <laughs> So think about stepping out of your comfort zone, just like these nominees here tonight have done. Step out of that comfort zone, face that fear, and follow your passion. Thank you, Austin. And I'm teaching people how to use every kind of weapon, submachine guns, automatic weapons, throw a grenade, <laughs> rocket launchers, oh yeah. There I stand, alone in the desert, petrified. So scared, I might never see my home again. Not long ago, I woke up and went, wait a minute, I'm a woman. I have these wonderful emotions. I cry when I'm sad, but I also cry when I'm angry. I cry when I'm annoyed with somebody. So I thought, maybe it's time I own my tears. <laughs> so what we were supposed to do is crawl out through this little hole, grab a hold of the strut, on the wing, get your feet down, one in front of the other, on the tire, and then take your feet off the tire and, and fly there like a kite until somebody says, go. <laughs> the thing you're supposed to do when they say go, you're gonna throw your arms back very gracefully, fall away from the plane and the chute's gonna open, okay? Yeah. So I'm there, I get out, I got a hold of the strut, and <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, feet off, my feet come off, and who the hell thinks you can hold on to your whole body weight when you're going at 200 miles an hour? <laughs> I know, at that point, I'm somersaulting through the air. <laughs> Build your own road. Ask for directions along the way, but if they don't fit, don't follow them. And if you end up somewhere, where you don't want to be, well, don't hesitate. Change directions and get out of there. When I was so devastated, so low, so lonely, so hurt, all of a sudden, I was full of confidence. I felt good about myself. I knew what I had done, and I was proud. And the next time I walked into the bar, oh yeah, jump out of an aircraft, <laughs> piece of cake, I've done that. <laughs> Wow, Nancy, I love that clip. I love it. Thank it is so you. amazing. What you do is amazing, and you have created this. I got this move, but or movement. But before we start uh, talking about that, I'd love you to share your background because I've said it many times. <laughs> Can I say what I? Yeah, like, go yeah, ahead. So doesn't Nancy <laughs> look like she would be your your kid's grade two teacher? You're very kind, nice sweet face that you'd make a nice apple pie. Got you fooled. Wow. <laughs> so let's hear about the real Nancy. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, it's it's amazing. And even when I recount this story every once in a while, I go, is that my life? Yeah. Am I really? making this up? <laughs> yeah. Um, home life wasn't great. And I ran away from home when I was 16. And at wow. 17, I joined the regular military. At 17? At 17. Wow. Now, of interest, it was years later when I was working for UNICEF, and I'm waiting for a friend to go to lunch, and I'm flipping through this book on how all these different countries did on child soldiers. Mm. And there's Canada, and I'm going, Canada didn't have child soldiers. And then I start to read, and of course, 18 is the international age for an adult. Okay. And so by allowing people like me in at 17, sure. back in the 70s, um, then I was indeed a child soldier. And right. now I was working in an organization that was looking after child soldiers. Mm. Canada did change those rules since right. then. So yeah, and I joined at 17 in the regular force into what was at that point in time an all-male tough security branch. My and goodness. so, yeah, you, you 
uh, you know, one of the things I was thinking about recently, um, especially with, you know, International Women's Days and women's marches and so on, mm -hmm. and thinking about feminism mm -hmm. and thinking, yeah, y you know, you were in the closet if you were a feminist. It was all about actions, mm -hmm. but don't dare speak the words. Right. So that was kind of my military career. And through there, I mean, I did everything that I was ever challenged to do. So I was a non-armed combat instructor and, and I instructed weapons, whether they were automatic weapons and submachine guns and grenades and rocket launchers and, you know, I did all of that stuff and I had a ball doing it. And, you know, the wonderful thing was that even though, you know, there's a lot of pushback to having women, mm -hmm. by doing things the way I did and always keeping that smile that oh, you call yes. the school teacher, oh, yes. yeah, by keeping that, I think I also ended up with my supporters and my allies right and without them I would never have made it so 20 years later I retired as a senior officer and wow. thought that that was going to be it but you know what doing crafts and craft shows That's was fun yet. for a little while oh, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And then I got the call. Sure. Yeah. And the call came from the United Nations. It was a friend of mine, an old colleague from my branch, one of my allies. Mm -hmm. And he was calling on a satellite phone from a desert in Afghanistan. And he's like, Nancy, you know, this particular part of supporting humanitarian aid, we've never had any women in here doing this. Uh, so are you interested? Jeez. I thought for about... Yeah, two seconds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I said, well, I have to discuss it with my husband. Right. Right. You know. <laughs> Honey, we're going to Afghanistan. Yeah. Was that the discussion? Yeah, I was yeah. going to Sudan. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. yeah pretty and much. of course, I'm so fortunate that I have Jay in my life oh, because he's, he's, a he's game. He's supportive. Mm -hmm. He's there. He's like, oh, cool. Okay. Let me start packing. Wow. So off we went. And that was the start of my UN career. Mm. And I've only recently retired from the United Nations, from UNICEF, as a matter of fact. Right. And and I had such an amazing time. I worked in more than 40 countries wow. from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Sudan, East Timor. I just had a ball. And, you know, granted, some of the most misogynistic old boys mm -hmm. clubs in the world. But I always find that a little bit of fun because that's when you fun. get. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> really, it was. Yeah. But, yeah. but that's when you get to sort of go, no. Excuse me. I got this. Mm -hmm. I got Step this. Step out of the way because I got this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it worked. And but I your had life fun. Has been, yeah, but you, you say you had fun, but your life was in danger in t at times, was it not? I mean, you were in dangerous situations. There were moments, but of interest, I was the person determining whether it was too dangerous for people to be there. Okay. So I was that front line who was going in. So I usually had more information than other people. Mm -hmm. I certainly had connections, connections with rebels, with militaries that were committing these offenses, with all kinds of people. I was the one that had the connections and was doing, I, I guess in a way, the negotiation. And right. then also this assessment of, is it really safe? Can we bring the humanitarians in? Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of negotiating in that. Right. and. There were a few moments, I will certainly say that, but you know, a little adrenaline's not a bad thing. Oh my goodness. I like adrenaline going for a little jog or something. I just, it, like, what do you think? How were you able to do what you did? What compelled you at 17 to join the military, to say yes? What do you think it, what was it? That was pretty simple, really. Um, mm -hmm. My mother had died when I was 16, okay. um, lost her battle with cancer. Mm -hmm. My brother, by that point, had committed a number of offenses and was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic okay. and institutionalized, albeit not forever, and, right. and then back and in and out. Um, and my father had kind of moved on to a new family. Oh, okay. So I was sitting in a, a bit of a difficult place. Lost, I'm yep. sure. And there'd yeah. been some abuse in our family as mm -hmm. well. And so I really knew that I needed to do something. And I was smart enough at 17 to realize that. Mm -hmm. I had excelled in school, and everybody assumed that I would stay in school, go on to university. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that just wasn't going to happen. Right. So I found myself at one point living in a campground and mm -hmm. dispatching taxis on the midnight shift. Wow. Yeah. And I, I woke up when it was starting to get really cold in that campground mm -hmm. and I woke up and I went yeah they're about to close the campground what am I gonna do 
I had always been really, really interested in police work. Okay. Really interested. Mm -hmm. But I was 17. Right. And 1975, which this was, mm -hmm. was the first year that the RCMP and a few of the really progressive police forces started to take women in right. a full constable role. Mm -hmm. So I thought, yeah, that's what I want to do. But I'm 17, you have to be 21. Right. Then I found out that the military also had a police force. And because in the military they would take people into any branch, so it didn't matter whether you were infantry, whether you were intelligence, military police, or supply, right. you could join at 17. Wow. It's so, so young. It's so it is. Young. And when I see 17 year olds now, yes. I, yeah, there's Those no four years way. Older than that twins yeah. right like come on that's yeah. yeah it's so young but um but wow you've taken everything you've learned in all of your experience and now you've created something extraordinary because i've actually seen the evolution of it and when you said uh yes i've got this well now you're teaching other people to say i got this and so yeah. so tell us about i got this well I'm going to back up just on okay, one little yes, thing first yes. because there is something I want to say because you sort of made this sound like it's incredulous and oh my goodness and this is so wild and brave and crazy and you it know. is however mm -hmm. what I do want to say is I, I, I often hear women say to me I could never do what you've done mm. and I want to say stop saying that stop saying that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. stop saying that yeah. because you know what you could do anything that mm. I've done I'm not special there was nothing special in any of this. However, you probably really wouldn't want to do what I've done. Sure. And so I think it's really important for women to be able to put that the in perspective. Mm -hmm. Because it isn't that you can't. Mm -hmm. You have your own challenges, the, your own fears to overcome. You have your own things mm -hmm. that you're passionate about right. and really want to do. Mm -hmm. And they're probably things that I couldn't do. Of course, sure. Or I could. But maybe I wouldn't. Want to. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I really want to put that in perspective for people because I'm not special. Um, well, I am. Of course, you, know, you are. We all are. But <laughs> we were just talking you know, about that. We're special. Yeah, but but it's an important distinction. Yeah. And you're also, I mean, you were trained, you know, one step at a time. Yes. You know, it's kind of like people say, oh, I couldn't do what you're doing, speaking and doing all this. So, well, I started out petrified, so yeah. <laughs> it's training. It's so you you exactly. trained and learned as you went along. Yep. So, yes, but now you're taking all of you, what you've learned, exactly. and now I was going to say empowering others, but we talked about <laughs> that word empowering. <laughs> Talk to me about that. So okay. I got this, and yeah. what, yes, what do you want to bring to women? So. <laughs> I'll, I'll back it up to my last number of years when I was with uh, the UN, mm -hmm. UNICEF specifically, and I was at headquarters in New York. I traveled all over the world and I backfilled and did all kinds of really great things. But one of the most amazing things that I did mm -hmm. is I, I took the lead on customizing and providing training that was specifically for women working in different environments around the world. Mm -hmm. So these women, some of them would be internationals working outside of their home countries, others would be nationals in those countries. And I went to more than 27 countries to provide this training and it was so, so popular that I trained 12 trainers before I left and wow. they're all way too busy. Mm -hmm. So. It was something that was missing for women right. was this, and I'm going to say more than training, but a space, a safe space where we can actually talk about our fears yes. and talk to each other about how do how did you manage that? How, how did you manage to stand up in front of a whole bunch of people mm -hmm. and speak? How do we share mm -hmm. what we've what we've learned? So when I got home, I realized, you know, there's a place for this in Canada too. Yes. So I started, I got this and and started out with the workshops. Then that sort of grew into speaking and mm -hmm. keynote speaking. Yeah. And I'm loving sharing that message because, well, you said empower. Yes. And this is something that, that I've thought about a lot mm -hmm. because I, you know, the time when I was 17, 18, 19 in the military, I don't think I ever felt like I didn't have power. Right. I wouldn't have made it if I didn't know that I had power. Mm -hmm. So when I think about, we always, we so often, language is so important, we so often take the things that are happening and we shift them to the women. Well, women need to be more empowered. Right. No, women have power. Mm -hmm. 
our culture needs to shift so that there are not people who are abusing women and abusing other people right. who are at risk. Right. So it isn't about us not having power, it's about other people stopping doing some of the things that sure. they're doing. You know, we look at the Me Too. Mm -hmm. Those are, you know, especially in Hollywood, these are pretty powerful women. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do they need to be empowered? No, mm. women have power. And the women that I've met all over the world, and I, I think of times in the Darfur's in Sudan, women who've experienced um, heinous, horrible things, yeah. worse than I can even wrap my head around, and yet these women could stand taller and prouder and support one another in ways that I couldn't imagine. Incredible. And when I look at a group of these women, mm -hmm. do I see people who are not powerful? Right. Not at all. I see a group of incredibly empowered people. Mm -hmm. They own that power. Now, are they fighting against something really tough sure. and wrong? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I like to shift the focus from, and you've heard me before too, shifting from victim yes. to target. Predators prey on a target. Mm -hmm. Women have power. Predators are the ones that need to be changed. It's the actions there. It's not the women that have to change and step up and do things better. Right. We do need to have a voice, though, right? If we a space for a voice. Yes. Yes. And and if we see something, say something. And if we don't like the way we're being treated, we need to acknowledge and do something. And right. I mean, that's Absolutely. yeah. That's part of it. Yeah. And we talked earlier in the fact that. We need, you know, why do these people become predators? Because at one point they were just innocent kids. You know, what happened? And of course, I our culture <laughs> plays a cultural. Big, yeah, it's hugely yeah. cultural. I, I mentioned my supporters and allies back in, you know, the 70s in the military. And this was a different, this is more than 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. This is a different environment than what exists today. And, you know, I mentioned those supporters and allies. Uh, there's not a one of them who didn't at some point discriminate, uh, harass, mm -hmm. or, or you know, the inappropriate things that sure. used to go on. Mm -hmm. But that was also very much embedded in the everyday culture. The norm. And it was their norm. Yeah. And that's how they all behaved. Sure. But then some of them could step away from that and still be my supporters and my allies. Mm -hmm. Now, I think we need to change mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. we, none of us want to be 40 years ago anymore. Right. Things need to change. And I think you make a good point about women needing to have a voice. But I also think it's important that if we understand we're not, somebody's not giving us power. Mm -hmm. That power's inside of, of us. Of course. It's already there. Yes. And it's okay for us to use it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I took your, I, I did take your workshop or your, your whole day. I loved every moment of it. And I, I did. I left, I don't know, kind of felt really good about myself. And, and it wasn't about being, you know, obnoxiously roar, roar, roar. It was just about, I do have power and it's yes. internal and, and I can use it and just little things and being more aware, unlocking your instinct, right? Yes. That was, and, and that's, and just using that. Learning to listen to your instincts, trust your instincts. Mm -hmm. And when something isn't right, learning that it's okay to say something. Yes. Because I think that's a big thing with women that we'll hear that little voice and we'll go, yeah, uh, but, but he hasn't really, he seems to be polite, everything seems to be okay, and, mm -hmm. and I'm feeling uncomfortable, but I'm not really sure why, and I mm -hmm. can't put my finger on it. Okay. And I think that's that voice that, no, it's okay. You, the fine line between being assertive, mm -hmm. be, being confident, and being aggressive. Mm -hmm. And we rarely need to be aggressive. Right. But being confident and assertive, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. And that's polite. Yeah. It's not impolite. Yes. And so to be able to, well, you remember my good guy filter. And that was one of the things that, that I really talk about during the, the workshops. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know, so everybody in their life can think of one man who is a really good guy. Yes. Respects women, he's good, he's kind, he's gentle, you know, all of these things. So 
think about that person. There's your good guy to put into your mind. Mm -hmm. Then when things happen, so I use the example of, you know, you're walking down the street, you've got your groceries, one of the bags breaks, there's oranges all over. So your good guy sees this woman who's now trying to gather all this up. Sure. Would your good guy offer to help? Absolutely. Of course he would. Sure. He's going to go over, oh, please, can I help you? Mm -hmm. And if this woman says, no, thank you, mm -hmm. might he ask a second time? You might say, Quite are you sure you look like you need help? Yeah, you know, and I don't, I don't mind. mind. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'm a good guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. and if she turned around, well, if he says I'm a good guy, I'm really going to worry about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. Oh, okay, yes. But, yeah, he's very likely to say, I really don't mind. Mm -hmm. And if she looks up and says, no, thank you, a second time, yes. what's he going to do? Okay, no problem. He's going to walk, walk away. away. He sure. might feel bad that he couldn't help her. He yeah. might look back. He might, yeah. you know, but he's not. So... The person who comes up then and doesn't respect that no, mm -hmm. no is not the start of a negotiation. No is, I like that, no is not the start of a negotiation. That's right. So no is just no. Somebody comes up and goes, oh, don't be so silly. Don't be so proud. I'll help you with that. I'll, you know, I've got this for you here. Let mm. me do this. And, you know, is that then somebody who's got your best interest at heart? Yeah, thinking, hmm. Filter yeah. that, but he yeah. seems like he's being so nice, mm -hmm. you know, he's really just trying to help. Mm -hmm. You know, it's my fault because I'm being too proud. Right. And I'm not letting somebody help. Right. So, you know, this is this is the that filter of the good guy filter. At that moment, when you're kind of wondering, this doesn't feel right, mm -hmm. but I don't know why, because he's really trying to be nice. Right. Filter it through your good guy. What would your good guy be doing? He would have respected. He would have respected the no. no. So then what do you do with this guy who's kind of insisting on helping? Yeah, and this is where, again, we can start to filter every one of his actions and we can call him on it because mm -hmm. he is expecting. There's there's some, you know, I don't know whether there's a book out there, 101 for harassing him, you know, yes. I don't know. but. You know, he is expecting a certain response from you. Yeah. When he says, oh, don't be so proud. Don't be so, you know, he's expecting you to go, well, well. Mm, okay. Uh, yeah. And it's no. We're in a public place here. And I'm like, excuse me? I said no. Mm -hmm. And you're allowed now to start to ramp that up because you recognize that he may appear like he's trying to be nice, yep. but chances are he isn't. So it's perfectly okay now to start to ramp things up mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. and even ask someone else for help or walk away and leave those oranges on the ground. Yeah. yeah, and you know, and isn't that those little things that you can just say, it's okay for me to, even if he is a good guy and, and you're, you're wrong, that's okay because if those little hairs on the back of your neck are standing up or you just, yeah. your radar and maybe you're wrong, but that's okay. That is also your prerogative, isn't it? It absolutely is, but you know, it's interesting about our instincts I would venture to say our instincts are never wrong. Right. We may never know why mm. we had that little alarm bell, the, right. the, you know, the hair standing up on the back of our net, those spidey senses going mm -hmm. off. We might never know why, because if we respond properly, the situation will change. Right. So right. it's interesting, but yeah. see, that's, those are the kind of things you shared. And, you know, if someone is in your personal space and you're just kind of saying, you know, Thank you. I just would like you to step back a little bit and, you know, maybe yep. your hand up. And if somebody won't go away, the little chest rub. I showed that to my daughter as soon as I got home. I was like, Jaden, get over here. If someone's in your personal space and they won't go away, do a little chest rub on you with your knuckles. It really hurts. Here, come here. Let's try it. Yeah, just, and it's so subtle. Just so subtle. So subtle. Like, I just need some space here. You haven't listened to my words. Yes. In fact, you've denied them and said, oh, honey, sweetheart, oh, you know, yeah. hey, don't, it's just, I'm just being nice mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. You know, so someone has, has not listened to your words. You've tried. You've done all the right things. And then at a certain point, it's kind of like, no, I'm going to send you a strong message. That doesn't mean you're going to lay them out on the ground and sure. kick out. You I know. know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not at all. But there's just different ways of sending that message and changing the circumstances. That's right. And like you said, it is okay to have a voice. It's okay to, and you have power. Yes. And you know, just in this short time together, you've given us a few, okay, we are empowered. 
we do have power within us. And you are sharing this message. And are you going to keep doing workshops? I really hope you do. Absolutely. Yes. I'm definitely going to continue doing the workshops. Um, and I'm going to continue speaking because yes. it's a way to reach even more people uh, you know, at a time. So I'm excited about that. And I'm excited about being able to, to, to take what I learned, maybe you know, the School of Hard Knocks. Yeah. Every woman is going to face their challenges. But if we can sort of learn from the past and keep moving it forward, mm -hmm. then you're facing new challenges and you don't have to relearn the same lessons. Exactly, yes. And, and we do need to create a culture of change. And that's one voice at a time, many voices at a time. And, you know, let's, let's just have safe. It's all about safety, yeah. respect, and what that means to you. Yes. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I am so excited that you are doing this work. I am so excited that you have all of this experience, all of this knowledge, and you share stories on your website and information. And uh, what is your website? We'll have that. We'll have it on there. But okay. I just want to make sure people it have it. It is www.igotthis.com. Dot space. Ah, I so I it. got this space. I got this space. I yeah. got this space. And this is something that we can, when we learn it, we can bring it to children. Absolutely. Uh, right? To yeah. our children. And again, uh, I just love reframing that we do have power. Yes. We don't need to, be, we, we have power within. We, we were born with power. It belongs to us. It does. Um, and, and it's that cultural world that we've lived in. And, and that's where the shift needs to happen. So our children, we bring this to our daughters, we bring it to our sons too. Absolutely. Because To need... the children, that's what I said, to our sons and to our yeah. daughters and to the schools and everywhere. Yeah. It's Thank so you. Do you we're out of time. Can you? I know. No way. So, yes, I'm telling you. Nancy okay. and I could talk all day. Long. Oh, yeah, this happens. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you for being here. Thank you for what you do. Check out the website. And if, yeah, if uh, your workshop was phenomenal, like I said, I felt all empowered. I couldn't, uh, yes, it was wonderful. Oh, I was empowered. I found my inner power. See that? There you See? go. There I you found, go. I found my voice. But it, um, it just felt good to unlock my own instincts. Yes. So thank you for everything that you are bringing to our culture. It is such a pleasure and so much fun. Thanks so much. And thanks so much for joining us on Real Life Talks. These are conversations, sometimes hard ones to have, but they're about showing up for yourself, showing up for others, and yes, creating a culture of change. So my call to action, if you do want to be able to just show up, is as always, plan your life, plan your death, and then just love your life to death. And always, Bring your own tambourine to the party. <laughs> Thanks. See you next time. <laughs> I love oh, my tambourine, I like that. right? That's, that's, that's a great my tambourine. Way to, uh, yeah.